Hi, I'm B.T. Newberg of the brand new podcast, The History of Sex. We explode gender norms by exploring their incredible variety across time. In today's culture of gay marriage, trans rights, and a new politically correct term every day, things can feel a little chaotic. It makes you long for the good old days. When men were men and women were women, and nothing could be more clear, right? Well, sorry to break it to you, but... Those days never existed. If there's one thing the history of sex teaches us, it's that sex and gender have varied fantastically across different eras and cultures. For example, did you know that the Nazis encouraged young women to bear a child out of wedlock for the fatherland? Or that pre-contact Hawaii had no such thing as marriage? Or that ancient Romans had no concept of orientation, only a vague sense of preference for one sex or the other? That's the kind of stuff that we'll be covering in our new podcast, The History of Sex. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get podcasts. The History of Sex. Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And welcome to a new year at the Endless Knot Podcast. Happy New Year! I know it's barely still January, and it's only still January if I manage to edit this faster than I fear I might. But anyway, <laughs> this is our first episode of 2020, mm-hmm. and we thought we'd start off with a uh, bang. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> By turning to a topic that was suggested by a listener, in fact, requested by Gabby Sobral. So thank you, Gabby, for suggesting it. We'll come to what the topic is in a moment. Before we get to that, though, we have a new patron to thank, Hassan. Thank you. And we very much appreciate the support and remind everyone else that if you want to, you can check out patreon.com and search for the endless knot podcast and if you feel like supporting us you're welcome to do so and we would really welcome the help Woo-hoo. <laughs> now the topic that we're going to turn to then is sex <laughs> <laughs> yes gabby asked us and i don't think we're actually going to answer her question to be honest because she asked us about the definitions of sex and gender and their scientific or current contemporary distinctions Mm -hmm. as well as their history and i think we should start off by saying that we we really aren't going to answer that first question very well i may sort of answer it a little bit but i think the the long answer is It's a really long answer, and it depends what discipline you're talking about, and it depends the context. I mean, there is no hard and fast definition of both. I will also talk about it a bit. Well, and I'll talk about at least in terms of what we mean by those words and when we meant those things by those words. I I think you're already... There's no... (laughs) Who's the we in that sentence? Right now, today, Mm. in the world... What do we mean by sex and gender? I well, don't think indeed. there's a consensus. So When someone first used the word to oh, mean... Oh, yeah, but that's in the past. I'm talking yes. about right now, and she right. did ask about now, too. Right. And I, that's what I mean. I don't think we're going to get to that. Anyway, nonetheless, it is a fascinating topic. They're mm-hmm. really interesting words, and the whole suite of words to do with sex, mostly not to do with sex the act, though we will talk about that, too, mm-hmm. but in particular to talk about the divisions of people into sexes Mm -hmm. and genders and what all those words that have to do with those things some of the history of some of those words yeah it's a huge topic and on that note we should draw your attention to the podcast that you heard introduced at the beginning of this episode the history of sex indeed and you know this topic is so complex and has so many different directions it can go Mm -hmm. It's the sort of thing that you can't do in a single episode. It's the sort of thing you need a whole podcast to really explore. Especially if you're going to explore it outside of the very narrow confines of the classical Greek and Roman world and medieval English and modern English world, which is such a small slice of humanity and humanity's perspectives on sex and gender. Or or even language Mm -hmm. as a whole. Mm -hmm. So we really, I've been listening to BT's 
Newberg's podcast since it began. I've been really finding it fascinating, and I would very strongly recommend that you check it out. There's longer episodes, and then he does these little short shorts on little topics to do with the main episodes that you know, didn't fit into the main episode or that are just interesting on their own. Remind me of our end notes from mm-hmm. the videos. And uh, they're all really interesting and very well produced and put together. So thank you for the promo, BT. And we definitely recommend people go over and check that out. Indeed. All right. So since we're going to be talking about sex and gender and gender divisions and sex divisions, <laughs> we thought the only sensible thing to do was to reflect that with our cocktails. So, Mark, what are you drinking tonight? <laughs> well, it's pink. And it's called... Pink Lady. Absolutely. And I am drinking something I made up to match since there was no exact equivalent. I think we're calling it a, are we calling it a Blue Gentleman or a Blue Lord? I like Blue Gentleman personally. <laughs> All right. Ladies Which and gentlemen. It's exactly, exactly the same, but blue. So a Pink Lady is gin, Applejack, lemon juice, and a few drops of grenadine for the pink mm-hmm. and an egg white. And what I've done for my blue gentleman is gin, applejack, lemon juice, and a few drops of blue curacao, which is a blue citrus flavored yeah, uh, liqueur, and an egg white. So mm-hmm. they really should taste mm-hmm. very similar. And both garnished with the cherry. Both garnished with the cherry, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yes, yeah, so cheers. Cheers. Mm. It's a nice drink. Yeah, the, the grenadine really doesn't contribute much to the flavor. It's no. just there for the pink. No, it's, it's very... Only a small amount, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's not, therefore, very sweet. The real sweetness comes from the Applejack. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Which, in our case, was not actually Applejack, but was our homemade crabapple brandy from several years ago. We just traded to try Mm -hmm. the others. I guess this is a little little more sweet because of the... I had to put a little more of the blue curacao in that one because Mm -hmm. it isn't as strong a color and the Applejack was kind of dark, so it was looking just kind of gray. But this one's a bit fruitier and that one's a bit orangier. So, yeah. Tasty cocktails, though. And not, even though they look frothy and sweet, they're really, with the lemon juice and everything, they're not too sweet at all. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those are our drinks, blue and pink, for one set of traditional (laughs) gender divisions. We won't get into the whole color thing, because we've already done that in our color episode, the whole blue, and red, pink, gender breakdown of colors. We did that in... Red, I think we might have Was talked it about it in. I, I suspect that if we went, if you went back to the red episode, you would hear us. We did talking a pink about episode, it. so it might be. In, oh, it might be in that. There was too. a pink. Bra- there was a, the last episode yeah, we did was brown. a bunch of yeah. colors, so it might be in that. So one. go and listen through all of the color, color episodes. episodes. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to hear the history of why Europeans started to, where North Americans in particular started to associate pink and blue with female and male, mm-hmm. respectively. All right. Well, let's launch right in then. And talk about what the words sex and gender mean. So I will start by giving a definition of these things in the modern world. So I'm going to just read from Wikipedia here, which obviously is not the final word on any discipline's view of sex or gender. Mm -hmm. But I think it could be said to represent a reasonably mainstream but slightly academic view of what those two words mean. Almost everything in this following definition of sex, however, can be and has been disputed and is more complicated than it says. So, sex is the biological distinction of an organism between male or female defined by the gametes it produces or the reproductive organs it has in anisogamous species. So then I'll just read gender. Gender is the range of characteristics pertaining to and differentiating between masculinity and femininity. Depending on the context, these characteristics may include biological sex, i.e. the state of being male, female, or an intersex variation, sex-based social structures, i.e. gender roles, or gender identity. Now, as I said, all of those things can be disputed, not the least of which both definitions rely on male and female as the two sexes and the two genders. Yeah. And yet both of them kind of gesture towards the fact that that is already too restrictive. So the basic distinction that is being made is that somehow sex is a physical thing and gender is a social thing. Right. And I think that is broadly speaking a consensus among several disciplines now in academia and some but not all areas of medicine that that there is a distinction. I think it is the general way it has been used. Probably we could say the most common 
way of discriminating between those between two those terms. two words yes so wikipedia points out that this distinction between biological sex and gender comes from a particular sexologist john money in 1955 and you'll probably talk about that and before that there really wasn't that kind of a, a strong distinction mm -hmm. between those two terms used that way right so that's just to give us a baseline. And as I said, that simple question of what, and this is really what Gabby was asking, and that's why I say I don't think we're going to answer it, because mm -hmm. that question of like, what does it mean to say it's a species divided by their ability to produce gametes? I mean, if you can't produce a gamete, are you're, you not a sexual, not, yeah. you don't have a sex? <laughs> like, is a prepubescent child does not have, have a sex? sex? Yeah, right. Does a postmenopausal woman not have a sex? Yeah. Does a sterile man not have a sex? Mm -hmm. It doesn't even mention the, it doesn't use chromosomes to distinguish it, but some people would like to use chromosomes to talk about who, and that of course does relate to what gametes you produce. But as science has been pointing out recently, there's not actually just two states of chromosomal organization in humans, there's more than two. So it is a really complicated question, and I will leave that to others, the History of Sex podcast, but also science and scientists and, and other specialists to get into the details of that. So let's just leave it for the moment as saying that, that is the, those are the sort of word clouds of distinction, that sex tends to be used more often to speak about physical and measurable distinctions and gender to be related to appearance, presentation, roles, emotional feelings, societal constraints, mm -hmm. that range of stuff, broadly speaking. Now, all right, so where do these words come from? So in a sense, these two words are coming from two different directions, semantically speaking. So sex comes from probably, and yeah. I'll get into this in a minute, probably comes from the idea of dividing up into categories. Mm -hmm. Whereas gender, I mean, it also has to do with categories in the sense of kinds, different kinds, mm -hmm. different groups. But it comes from a root that means it's a generative root, right? <laughs> That's where pun, the word... Pun fully intended. Pun fully intended. So sex is a, a bit of a disputed etymology. We can trace it back as far as Latin sexus, mm -hmm. which has that range of meaning. It means a sex in however we want to think, and presumably you'll want to talk about this, whatever the Roman conceptualization of that is. Of what those categories mean if mm -hmm. they do. Yep, I will. The presumed etymology, the most commonly presumed etymology, certainly used to be that it came from the Latin verb secco secare, which means to divide or cut. In which case, it would go back to the Proto-Indo-European root sec, which means to cut. And it shows up in a whole bunch of different words in, in English and, well, in Latin and Greek and yeah. Indo-European languages in general. Root, yeah. yeah, so like scythe, the, the agricultural implement, cutting down crops. Or bisect and... Bisect. Insect. So the, the bug, the insect, is called so because its body is divided into sections yeah, also right. from that root segment sector okay. yes however etymologists more recently have expressed doubt about this etymology and this is i think if i'm understanding correctly largely on the basis of phonological issues that if sexus comes from seco sacare you would expect to see a spelling at some point far back enough anyways like sectus from the past stem, the past participle of seco sacare, sacawi, sectu. Yeah. Yeah. But then they don't have. They, they don't, don't have, have a, a better suggestion. Yeah, yeah. They don't have a better suggestion. There's no other suggestion that has received any kind of consensus. consensus. So that's the most common one. They're just sort of doubters who have no better suggestion right. now. Yeah, so the, the word sexus, just to pick up on that quickly in Latin, is a classical word for sure, but it's not a terribly common one. Like, mm -hmm. it's used, but it's kind of a technical term, and it means a sex, male or female, of men or beasts. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it hasn't changed that much mm -hmm. since its origins. Now, it's 
earliest appearance in English is in this idea of the two categories, mm -hmm. male and female. Uh, the first citation that the OED has is 1382, the Wycliffeite Bible, in that sense, talking about the male sex and the female. Mm -hmm. Is it in Genesis? It is, or in fact, in Genesis. In Genesis 6, 19. If so I of all were... things, having soul right. of any flesh, two thou shalt bring into yeah, the normal. ark, yeah. that male sex and female... So when does it start to mean copulation? Surprisingly late. I actually knew that. I was, I was feeding into <laughs> the line. Yeah, it's like 19th century, isn't it? 1900. Yeah. Okay, and H.G. Yeah. Wells oh, is the earliest that citation. I didn't know. That I did not know. <laughs> so in the book Love and Mr. Lewisham, I don't know that book. No. So he writes, we marry in fear and trembling. Sex for a home is the woman's traffic, and the man comes to his heart's desire when his heart's desire is dead. <laughs> well, that's grim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but yeah, so... So sexual intercourse. Mm -hmm. Sex so, doesn't mean intercourse. But that's what. But that's how it comes to mean that, right? Yeah, It starts presumably. as sexual intercourse. Sexual intercourse. And as then it a modifier. Short, and then it shortens mm -hmm. to sex as a standalone. Yeah. Yeah. So it does, sexual as an adjective is much older than Pro, that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So sexual, just as a, you know, characteristic of, well, in fact, particular to the female, mm. is from 1622, now obsolete, but the sort of more general of a relating to the factor condition of being either male or female. Right. So in that. Sexual characteristics. Sexual characteristic sort of thing, sense, yeah. that's from 1650. Biological sense of plant or animal or other organism characterized by sex. Mm -hmm. 1830, designating the organs. The intercourse, yeah. relating to, tending towards, or involving sexual intercourse or other forms of intimate physical contact from 1753 in the phrase sexual commerce. Right. Sexual commerce, congress, intercourse, those are all mm -hmm. words that get used. Sexual yeah. appetite, mm -hmm. William Wordsworth. <laughs> hmm. um, Seems very technical for one of his yeah. poems. Yeah. So you can see, the, I mean, the progression makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. It's still later. Yeah. It's not the original sense. No. All right, so that's sex, and it really hasn't in many ways changed that much. The introduction of gender as a separate category is a distinguishing of biological from social, mm -hmm. and that distinction would not have been particularly, like that's that distinction is not recognized by these earlier uses. Right. Sex yeah. was considered natural, right? And mm -hmm. that's, though we can talk about, I will talk about constructed versus natural. Right. Now, the word gender mm -hmm. goes back to a uh, Proto-Indo-European root, gena, mm -hmm. which again is, so this is hugely productive and in all kinds of words that have to do with either biological sex or reproduction mm -hmm. or what have you. So we get words like gender, but also generate, engender, miscegenation, gene, genotype. All these kinds mm -hmm. of words. Generation. Generation. Geminate. And so specifically, it comes into Latin in the word genus, mm -hmm. which means, well, I don't know how we would define it, race, stock, family, birth, Type, descent, classification, origin. grammatical, gender are the, is how my dictionary defined it. Okay. So this one comes into English first in the grammatical sense. Mm -hmm. So it's first attested by the OED in that grammatical sense around 1390. Mm -hmm. And we will come back to talking about grammatical in more, gender in more, in more detail. detail later. Yeah, so we'll detail. come back to that. Yeah. Specifically in that sense, that grammatical sense, it's referring to the sort of European languages. Mm -hmm. So Latin and then French and German and English and other European mm -hmm. languages. It becomes used in an extended use to refer to non-Indo-European languages, even when there is no connection in terms of these grammatical categories to biological sex. So that happens from 1819. Mm -hmm. Now, the sense of gender in terms of referring to human beings, mm -hmm. that is first attested in 1474. Okay. So about a hundred years between its use as a grammatical term to referring to natural gender, human gender or whatever. But when it's being used then in the 15th century, 
it's not being used in contradistinction to sex. It's being used as another way of saying sex, yeah. right? Yeah. There are two genders. There are two sexes. Yeah. So the interesting comparison that we can make here also is to see what other terms were available at various times. Mm -hmm. So both gender and sex, as I said, they come in in Middle English, right? And mm -hmm. late Middle English at that. Right. So there were obviously earlier words in English. Yeah. And so the sort of native Germanic terms for these things are basically, well, basically they all come from the same root as gender, mm -hmm. but through the Germanic line. So that would include words like kin, K-I-N, which in Old English is kin, which can be used to mean you know, anything from like a race, a people, mm -hmm. a nation, a family line or whatever. But it can also be used to refer to sex or gender in the sort of natural gender. Right. Okay. But also in the grammatical sense. So we do see that in that usage. And then the other related term to that in Old English from this, again, from the same root is kind. So and and we think of that now in in very much the categorization, right? You know, what kinds are there? Right, right. right? But so in Old English, it could be used. It, it can actually have a more general sense of nature, yeah, kind or species of animal, of plant, mm -hmm. natural state or condition, and it can be used to mean family, offspring, progeny. Mm -hmm. It can gloss Latin generatio or natio, nation, mm -hmm. people. But it can also be used in, especially when it's used in the, with the prefix jukund, as opposed to just the plain form. It can be used in more technical senses, I guess. In fact, there's a more range of senses. So it can be used to refer to sex or gender in that sense. Okay. In that natural, in terms of that natural gender categories of male and female and there's there's quite a few other little subtle shades of meaning that this word could be used in in mm. old english okay so those are the if you're talking about what words they would have used to refer to either grammatical gender or biological gender mm -hmm. uh, those are the two words you would go to kin or yukund right and i mean i know that we've sort of already made this point but i just want to make it really clear we're talking about cultures that divided the world, we'll come back to this, but basically into two genders yeah, and two sexes. What we're doing with this is not trying to dive into etymology to prove that this is true of the world. I just want that to be really yeah. clear. So that's, that's an etymological fallacy. Yeah. Just because the word used to mean something doesn't mean that that's a true thing about the world. The true the well, true meaning of a word. And just or because the Romans and the Greeks had X or Y view. Yeah or the English did, mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's true or natural or yeah. real or the only way of thinking about things. Yeah. So just... It, so it's particular to these particular languages mm -hmm. at these particular times. It is by no means universal in yeah. terms of cross-culturally in yeah. different cultures. They may have divided things up in all kinds of different ways. Yeah. And of course, language changes over time. So just because it meant that then doesn't mean it has, has to, to mean, mean that, that now. now. And people have also been wrong in the past. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever they thought of, may have been true or not true within their own culture, but they can also, we can look back and say, no, they, they thought the world, you know, they thought the, the sun revolved Plato around Plato thought the... the womb wandered around the body. Yeah. So like things were wrong. Yes. So just, I just really want to put that right up front here because we're going to talk a lot about this, you know, two genders and sex and men and women and what they are and aren't and all these things. And what we're doing is talking about what these particular mm -hmm. cultures, or at least the remnants that we have to access, mm -hmm. what the mainstream views in these cultures thought. Yeah. Well, and as we will see when we get to talking in more detail about grammatical gender, not all cultures divide right. things up in terms of that categorization. Absolutely. So just to be really explicit about that, mm -hmm. because, you know... This is one of the many fields in which our specialties get used to argue for points of view and ideologies that we don't agree with. Yeah. So I just want to be really, really clear about that. So we're going to talk a lot about binary genders mm -hmm. because it would be misrepresenting the past not to talk about some of these normative views. But that doesn't mean either I agree with them or that they represent any real, you know, any any higher truth than any other truth at any other point or time. Okay, that said, the other words that I will just 
point out, I haven't talked about Greek very much. So Greek has genos as well as a word for sex, right? Yeah. Sex or, or type. So that's there in both Latin and Greek, whereas sexus isn't anywhere in Greek, which is one of the mysteries, right? There's no relative or connected word. I mean, there probably are words if it comes from that. Yes, but there's no root, word that's used. But it's to not mean used that. in yeah. that sense. Yeah. No. And since I don't think we're going to talk about it much elsewhere, there are, of course, bunches of words or some words for having sexual intercourse mm -hmm. in Greek and Latin, though there are probably many, many words for it that right. don't survive yeah. in our written sources. There's a lot of words I didn't write down. There's a whole bunch of words that just have to do with things like lying together, yeah, right. living together, sleeping together, being together. You know, mm -hmm. you can imagine every possible sort of euphemistic or even a very practical version of that. So I didn't write all of those down. But there are a few interesting words, like in Greek, this himeromai, which is passive of a female have sexual intercourse with. And I'm now going to be reading definitions. That... This is going to be terrible definitions. So terrible definitions. So then to have sexual intercourse commonly of the man and then in the passive of the woman. So this is clearly to do something to someone else. And then mixoifia is sexual intercourse and splekoma is also sexual intercourse. And I have no idea where these words come from. I just think it's interesting that none of them seem to be particularly productive in English. Right. So those are some Greek words. In Latin, we have coitus. Right. Coitus. Coitus. Which is from coirera. So coira is just to come together. Okay. Literally. And mm -hmm. I don't think in the orgasm sense, we probably should have put a warning on the front of this, but I'm <laughs> assuming that everyone will assume an episode about sex is going to involve some explicit words, but literally from like walking together. So defined as sexual congress or copulation. Then there's fututio from futuo, which is copulation or to have connection with a female. <laughs> <laughs> but futuo is the word that we find that seems quite vulgar that we do find only in Catullus and Martial so in our in our most vulgar some of our more vulgar poets mm -hmm. and it seems to be definitely a thing that a man does to a woman or to another man right but one that I think is interesting given our discussion of grammatical gender that we will have later is conjugatio which is the word that gives us conjugate or conjugation. Oh, yeah, it's right. that word, mm -hmm. conjugatio, because it just means a combining or connection. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. But a conjugatio... Yoked together. <laughs> yeah. Conjugatio corporum is a conjunction of bodies, bodies right? and means okay. carnal intercourse, coition. And concubitio, which is also... To, to lie with. To lie, to lie with, yeah. but gives us concubine. Concubine. Oh, right. right. Okay. So right. A, someone who you sleep mm -hmm. with, but is not married to you. So the Latin ones are more productive in terms of the later English words, as far as I can tell. I've now just pulled up the, because I didn't specifically look at the verbs. Mm -hmm. So I pulled up the historical thesaurus entries for sexual intercourse as a verb. Mm -hmm. And so in the sort of more general intransitive sense, to have sex. Mm -hmm. The earliest English word is to play. Well, that seems fair. To do... Also work, one's kind, to bed, to couple, to gender, to go together. These are all later mm -hmm. medieval ones mm -hmm. now and so forth. To swive, which is the sort of famous one mm -hmm. in that intransitive sense, doesn't appear till 1440. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I know it occurs before that, but it must be in, the um, transitive. in a transitive yeah. sense to, to swive someone. Okay. So there's only one, and I guess this isn't surprising, there's only one that means to have sex with a man specifically, mm -hmm. which is Tup from 1549. See, that's used of animals, in particular sheep now. Oh, is it? And it's used of rams. Rams Tup use. Oh. Unless I'm completely mistaken. Okay, you're right. So of the U to admit the ram also transferred. Oh, okay. So it did start that way. It did start, it did that, start way. that way. Mm -hmm. Because it was originally of a U being... Of the U to admit the ram. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And yeah. then it was transferred to the active right. by the man, by the ram. Mm -hmm. So, yes. So you're right. It was originally of a woman mm -hmm. to have intercourse with a man. Yeah. But it has transferred. That's interesting because I have heard that word, but only in an agricultural context. So to have sex with a woman. Mm -hmm. Again, for a man to have sex man with a woman. Man to have sex with a woman. From 1592, we have the wonderful expression, to hit the master vein. Oh, yuck. To um, make a sexual conquest, specifically. Yeah. 
we probably don't need to go deep into words for sex, especially in modern English, mm -hmm. because there's a million of them. But one thing to point out is how many of them involve hitting. Yes. Yeah. The, it, the metaphor of hitting is extremely widespread and is one of the possible origins of the word to fuck. Yes. Though that's highly right. disputed or just doubtful about it. The explanation that I've heard anyway is that one of the possible derivations would be that it comes from to hit. Right. To strike. The other kind of semantic range is to possess in some yeah. way. Yeah. So to possess was used from 1592. So yeah, so the specific, the gender specific words are all kind of later. So I mean, the, I guess the earlier kinds of words are just in this intransitive sense. Right. And yeah, so it's words like to play or to mm -hmm. bed or to couple, mm -hmm. those kinds of words. Okay, so leaving that then, yet another whole range of things we could talk about at length. So th that's sex and gender and how they come into the language to come to mean what they mean now. Mm -hmm. Then we can talk about the sexes and the genders. Yeah. That, And again, we're going to focus on the older, I hesitate to even say the word traditional, but mm -hmm. the older ones that we have words for in Latin and Greek and Old English not to deny that there are more words. This is not going to be about exploring the very many modern words for different genders. Mm -hmm. That would could and would be another discussion, but we don't have, for instance, Latin words for those. Right. So since that's our specialty, that's what we're going to focus on. So man, woman, go for it. So man comes through the Germanic line, it comes from the Proto-Indo-European root man, which meant man. And... I think largely comes into English through those Germanic roots, not that it only appears in the Germanic languages. So there is a Sanskrit word, mana, which means man mm -hmm. from Indo-Iranian manu. There is also Russian muj, I guess, mujik, which means m man or male. So it does, it, it is a general Indo-European root. As far as I'm aware, I don't think it makes it into... Latin or Greek, though. Okay. So, male in mm -hmm. Latin is mas. It's, so, yeah, it's not that root. Yeah, that okay. comes from a separate root. Beyond that, no. Yeah. So, there, there are French words that come from that, but presumably they're getting it through Germanic. Germanic which would make sense. So, it's not a Latin from a Latin source. Germanic, yeah. yeah. So, there are a lot of different words, Indo-European words for man. Mm -hmm. There are very few for women. Mm-hmm. So this is one of the common Indo-European roots for man. We'll see some others. Okay. The word woman mm -hmm. is a compound of man. So it's not an original Indo-European root. It's formed, in fact, probably only within Old English. Mm -hmm. We don't see this compound in other Germanic languages. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a purely Old English word. So it's right. in, in that sense, it's relatively late. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know. When relatively. I say relatively late, yeah. yeah. Like well before 1,000, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. So woman is a, a compound of the word weef, wife mm -hmm. in modern English, mm -hmm. and man. Man in Old English came to mean person. So it started as meaning man. I think it think? started to mean man specifically, male. It started um, out meaning that and then became, became a general word for I person? I think so, though. I mean, you'd have to look at all the cognates in other languages, but... In Sanskrit and in the Slavic languages, it seems to specifically refer to male. Right, right. So unless there's some other language that mm -hmm. gives evidence of it being more generally person, I think it probably means specifically male. And then in the Germanic branches, starts to mean person. Or at least in Old English. I'm not, I don't know about I the other. You know... Oh, mensch. Yeah. Mensch can mean person. Yeah, mensch can yeah, mean person. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So maybe in the Germanic branches, it starts to mean yeah. it, it's broadened. So yeah, so it, it's extended to mean person more generally, which is why the compound Weifman is a way of specifically right, marking it as female person. A female person. Yeah. So Weif on its own could mean just woman. It didn't necessarily need married to mean woman. married woman. Right. It's a general word for woman in Old English. Right. We don't know for sure where it comes from. So there are a couple of theories, one of which is that it comes from the Indo-European root wape, which <laughs> means to turn, vacillate, tremble ecstatically. Really? But, but <laughs> probably in the sense of 
like veiled. So turned as in a kind of cloth around the head. Uh-huh. So it's referring to a clothing that women wore. Uh-huh. I'm, lo- I'm staring at you with all of the poems and phrases about women being changeable in right. my eyes right now. Saying, that is, really? That is really? certainly a thing. <laughs> that is certainly a thing. In this case, I think it's, it's probably just in the clothing sense, if this comes from that at all, which right, we don't right, know, right. which we don't know. Okay. At all. Okay. I will accept that. So that's, that's one theory, but again, it's not, it's by no means a consensus that that's where it comes from. Mm-hmm. So there are probably some other theories, but that's the one that's, most often mentioned yeah so it's turn twist turn wrap in the sense of a veiled person wrapped all right fine there's another so this is not any better to be honest there's another recent suggestion apparently that it comes from a proposed root meaning shame like pudenda right so (laughs) so the the latin word pudor which means shame but is used to refer to female but again i don't know that that suggestion has received any wide consensus or anything right now so this isn't the proto-indo-european general word for woman right Uh, so the other old english word that could be used to refer to woman generally and that does come from a proto-indo-european root that was a general word for woman is queen right Right. I remember this now. Mm-hmm. So Queen Quen in, or Queen, I guess it's a long E, Queen in Old English could mean queen in, in the sort of modern sense, but it could also just mean generally woman. And it goes back to a proto-Indo-European root, Gwen, mm-hmm. that meant woman. So this is probably the sort of standard Indo-European word that meant woman. Okay. And it comes into a number of different languages, including, I think, most importantly for our purposes, Greek. So that gives us the, you know, the gune. Yes, yes. Meaning woman, and from which we get a whole ton of English words. Mm -hmm. To um, do with gynecology. Gynecology, so that gyna root, or the prefix, or the suffix also. So genus, ginny, those those suffixes. So misogyny or whatever. So we get it as both a prefix and a suffix. It, It... comes into English in sort of more rare forms through a number of other languages. Interestingly, I suppose, is banshee from Irish. Okay. From the old Irish word ben, which means woman. It's a general word for woman. Okay. So a banshee is a female. Fairy. So yeah, old Irish ben comes from this root, means woman. Okay. So that's the general word for women in Indo-European languages. One last uh, couple of points, sort of previewing what we're going to get to when we get to grammatical gender but weef is grammatically speaking a neuter word it's not a feminine word right right so it's grammatically neuter right which just demonstrates that sometimes grammatical gender and natural gender don't always line up oh no absolutely not and this is true in, in other languages, yep. many Latin other languages. and Greek. Has, they often do, happening. probably more often than not, yep. but they don't always. No. And so weef was neuter. And in fact, the compound weef man is masculine because man is masculine. And so the gender is determined by the last element in the compound. Right. So weef man is actually a masculine word, even though it refers to a female person. Right. One last word uh, I will say that, at least in modern English, has become a general word for woman is lady. Yeah, I mean, sort of. Sort of. Only um, in some set phrases like ladies and ladies gentlemen, room. basically. Or ladies room, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's a room, euphemism to a certain extent. Like at it the, is, it's, yeah. yeah. And we've already talked about this word in a previous episode, but just to repeat that, lady comes from hlafdia in Old English, which means loaf maker. Mm-hmm. Woman who makes bread. Yeah. yeah. And it's the corresponding word to lord hlaford in Old English, which means loaf guardian yeah so she makes the bread he guards, he the, guards bread. the bread yeah. yep okay so you already mentioned gune well let me start with men because don't we always um, <laughs> so that man word is not as we just discussed in latin and greek so in greek the basic word for man is aner andros yes okay so it gives us the as as usual, it's the full root that gives us our derivatives. So and so androgyny is andros and gunos, men and woman. Mm-hmm. So that's a man as opposed to a woman. 
it isn't just a person and it also is very commonly means husband so this mm-hmm. is going to be a trend the common word for a man is also the word for the social role of husband right showing that it is not it is certainly not only the sex but also the gender right or maybe even more the gender than the sex yes. you know it is the societal role yeah. that's being the referred to gender role yeah. which is a term that was coined sometime in the 20s i forget now the 70s i think yeah, yeah. Uh, I came across that as as a specific coin when it was yeah. coined and who it was coined by in, in my readings. And so, well, that uh, I'll just sort of insert at this point that that word andros comes from Proto-Indo-European nair, which meant man, mm-hmm. or it actually seems to have had the basic sense of vigorous, vital, strong. Right. And we're going to see that again in a moment mm-hmm. in Latin. There's also the word arsen or arsen which can be, interestingly enough, masculine, feminine, or neuter, meaning male. Hmm. So, I don't know this, this word. I can't say that I ever saw it, but it seems to have been sort of a technical word. And it can be, it is the word that's used in Greek for the masculine grammatical gender. Do you know if there are any English derivatives from it? Not to my knowledge. Hmm. There were a number of compounds in Greek with it, so like man loving and things like that, you right. know, like used that comp part of the compound. So it does seem to me male mm-hmm. specifically, but no, it's not a word I know. Hmm. Otherwise. I wonder where that comes from. And then there's also areneikos from arein, meaning male. I don't know that one either. Mm-hmm. So those are just interesting words. I can send you off to figure these things out <laughs> later, but I mean, you know, Greek, Greek is often weird. And Greek etymology can be difficult because really? there it seems to be a fair amount of vocabulary that comes from isolated. outside of Greek yeah, yeah. and possibly outside of Indo-European. So, yeah. so I don't I don't necessarily want to spend a whole bunch of time mm-hmm. on it. I just thought it was interesting that were a couple of other words for male. Mm-hmm. The other word for a husband that's more directly husband rather than man that means spouse is posis, hmm. but I think that has to do with promises. Mm-hmm. I might be wrong, but I think that's where it comes from probably connected to spouse, but that's just a guess. The word husband, by the way, didn't necessarily originally imply marital status. It, it literally means house dweller. So it comes into English from Old Norse. Yeah. So it's like the person in charge of the house, Yeah, basically. Then for woman, the basic word is gune, as we discussed, which also is the basic word for wife. Mm-hmm. And then there's also a word thelus, mm-hmm. which is an adjective meaning female. Interesting. Do you know where that comes from? Nope. And again, it seemed to turn up in a bunch of compounds. So like woman loving, girl crazy or something girl like crazy. that. So no, I don't know what Thelus is. Because I did a, a quick search, but it is by no means a comprehensive search for any other roots. Indo-European roots that meant man or woman. Mm-hmm. And, and those... I did not come up with anything else. Yeah. So just some interesting things. And then, of course, there is a word for person that is genderless though it tends to default to male but it does not mean male right which is anthropos right yes which of course we know yeah and that is the term for both the generic or the individual and in particular like that's human as opposed to gods or human as opposed to beasts right, right? so the distinction of type between man and woman is sure an important distinction but there's also the important distinction in the way that we use in English human so I don't know if you want to talk about human at some point. Right. You know, a distinct word. Interestingly, anthropos can also be masculine or feminine. Right. So you can use, hey, anthropos, you can say of a woman, the person, mm. and it can be feminine. That's interesting because it also comes from that same root that I mentioned before, nair, that mm-hmm. means man, but also vigorous, vital, right. strong. But I guess in the sense of someone who's alive. Yeah. It's not impossible. Yeah. It might be that sense, vital. Mm -hmm. So it can mean woman, in other words. Mm. If it's referring to a specific anthropos who is female, it would be he anthropos, Mm -hmm. the woman, the person. I'm just going to add the oppo part of Mm -hmm. anthropo, anthropos. Yeah. Well, specifically the eye or the face. Yeah. Opos. Yeah. Ops. Ops. Yeah. Yeah. So eye or face. Okay. So for Latin, the basic word for man is, of course, we're. We're. V-I-R. Mm-hmm. We're. And that is connected, as far as I know, it actually is, not just that the Romans thought it was, but is connected to words for strength. Right. Right. And force. So this does go back to one of the common Proto-Indo-European 
words for man, wero. So it's were in so old English. So it gives us right? in Old English. As and in werewolf. Werewolf. It comes into Celtic languages, fear. I don't mm. know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but... Yeah, uh, the one that's written on bathroom... We'll yeah, bathroom doors. Doors, where woman is mana. Yeah, mana. Uh, just to confuse people mm-hmm. who don't speak Gaelic. And of course, you know, coming through Latin, it gives us all kinds of words like virile yeah. and virtue, because apparently only men were virtuous. Yeah. Well, virtuous was originally strength. <laughs> strength, yeah. It becomes virtue later yeah. because it's mm-hmm. the virtue of a man, mm-hmm. <laughs> like the thing that is proper to a man, which is strength. Curia, by the way, is, is a compound from where, Latin where. So it's... Cur- sorry, what word? Curia, as in court. Oh, interesting. Okay. Latin curia. It basically literally men together. So we're then is, is man, and it also means husband. It, right. Just like aner means man and husband, we're means man and husband. And, it and also, man, I mean, in English, you know, a woman yeah. will talk about my man, yeah. she means her husband. So that's a general yeah. linguistic trend. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's see. not at all surprising. surprising. What is the main role of a man in yeah. society? It's to be a husband. And same with woman and wife in these societies anyway. Mm-hmm. The other thing is a weir can often be used to mean essentially like hero or man of courage. So it's a positive word. Like right, you wouldn't okay. you wouldn't use weir to talk in, about someone you didn't like, didn't like or, or yeah. to, to be disparaging. Like right, there's no okay. way of sort of using it in a disparaging tone. Mm-hmm. Whereas, it's not just some guy. No, it's it's, it's a man, mm-hmm. you know. So with mm-hmm. all of what that means. Right. Whereas the word for male like just of the male sex biologically is mas maris. Yeah. And you said that's not from the same root as man. It is not from the same root as man. So mas maris, which produces in English words like male or masculine, Mm -hmm. is not related to man. So the fact that they both begin with M is a pure coincidence. M A, -A, (laughs) nonetheless. Yeah, that's a pure coincidence. So masculine specifically comes from Latin masculus, yeah. I mean, the which scu- is a diminutive form. Yeah, it was, but it's also just an adjectival form. Yes. You know, like it, yeah. it's, a, it's an extension. And so male comes through French, mal, old French male or masle from Latin masculus. So it's mm-hmm. shortened, 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 shortened from that. Macho also comes from that. So mas, which means, as you say, male or, mm-hmm. you know, male sex. And is the word that's used when you're talking about mask with one of the words to mean grammatical gender. This comes from a root, a Proto-Indo-European root, mari. So I'm a little unclear about this. Some sources say that the, the Proto-Indo-European root means specifically young woman, but I think it can mean a young person of either sex. gender, <laughs> either sex, a young man or a young man or a young woman. I'm pretty sure that's right. That's what Corny has. Okay. So I think Corny is right about this. It can mean young man or young woman. And it, it also comes into Latin in the form maritus. Yes. A husband. Means husband. Yeah, I was going to come to that. Yeah. yeah. So thus giving us words like marriage, marry, marital, yeah. mariachi. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yes, I was going to say there's a bunch of words that mm-hmm. come from maris, so masculatus, masculinus, all mm-hmm. of these words that, that give us that. And then maritus, which mm-hmm. is husband, which is just husband. You can't use maritus to mean just, just mean a man. man. Right. It has to be a husband. And it's I, I find this interesting that it specifically seems to refer to a young person. It's Originally. not a general word for male or female or person. More in, in its original In its an original right. uh, Proto-Indo-European context. Yeah. And then for women in Latin, of course, we have the basic word. Well, it's hard to know which one of these is basic, to be honest. So we've got femina, Mm -hmm. which means a female. And the word is also used for grammatical gender. And it is a standard word for woman. Yeah. It doesn't tell you anything about her status. Just woman. Yeah. And this, of course, comes into English as feminine, yeah. uh, as well as female, which again is... It was femella, fe- which was a diminutive, diminutive. of femina, feminella, yeah. mm-hmm. femella, which then just got re-spelled to look like male. Yes. No. There's no etymological relationship between male except and they, female. Except that they both have the diminutive ending. So that's where the L comes from in both. Ah, right. right. right? Okay. But the vowel yeah. in female is the way it is because, by, analogy. by analogy to male mm-hmm. it would have probably been it was female, female. yeah, yeah, in, it would, yeah in terms of been english female. yeah yeah it, probably female. okay so that's femina shall i tell you the, where it comes from where yeah. it comes from so this this does go back probably to a proto-indo-european root day or day which means to suck so it's re- reference to breastfeeding right okay suckling 
And it is also the source, therefore, of fetus, Latin foetus. Right, okay. Fawn, fetal, fecund, fecundus in right. Latin. Right, Fennel, and I don't know why fennel. Oh, from the idea of producing. So fenum meant just sort of hay. It's just fodder, basically. Mm-hmm. Fodder. Hay and plants that you can use for, yeah. that, are, that are productive. That must explain fenugreek. Right. As well. So also interesting, filial. So from filia and filius in Latin, which means son and daughter. Reversed. Daughter daughter and son. son. (laughs) Uh, So it's also the source of that. Again, I guess it must be from the idea of a suckling child. Right. Probably the idea. Fellatio. Right. Felicity, the the sort of luck word. Mm -hmm. Felix in Latin. So it comes from that. Because I think Felix originally meant sort of fruitful or fertile and yeah. therefore lucky, yeah. happy. Yeah. And it does make it into Greek as well. Thale meaning nipple, again, which makes right. sense from the, the original sense of the word. Right. As well as thelus. You mentioned that, right? Thelus. Thelus. Yeah, there, yeah, there you go. There's, so there you there's, go. That's, that's where Greek, it comes from. That's the Greek word for a word for woman. Right. I didn't yeah. notice that thelus. before. So yeah, thelus, female, that comes from this, this root that Suckling means to word. suckle. Okay. All right. Well, another standard word for woman is mulier, mm-hmm. mulieres, which again can just mean woman. It, however, can mean and is quite often used to mean wife. Right. But it doesn't have to. It can just mean woman. So it, it's close to parallel to weir that way. It can right. just mean woman, but often can mean wife. And I've just discovered that there is, in fact, an English derivative from this that I did not know of before now. Do you know it? Uh, I feel, I feel like. This I don't think this come comes up, up often. In no, but I feel like this is one of these words that you know you learn about because it's a derivative. Ah, oh, no, other than like muliebral or something. But well, you're close. Muliebrity. Okay. <laughs> Loving one's wife or womanhood. Being a womanhood. Oh. S- state of puberty in a woman. Oh, okay. So coming to one's womanliness. Woman, yeah. Yeah. All right. Corresponding to virility. Oh. It was probably, I bet it was coined rather late to have them. Just to be parallel. Parallel to that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so that's Moliere. Do you have anything about where that comes from? Traditionally said to to be a comparative to the stem of mollus, soft. Oh, yes, I saw that in the dictionary. So more soft, kind of soft, or weak. Weaker. Mollus weak. I don't know. Maybe it's that. Yeah, it's possible. It seems uh, somewhat unsatisfying to be honest. To be well, to be to come to be such an important word for yeah. women, it seems kind of. Well, and apparently there were also phonetic ob- objections to this to the derivation. Mall to m- mool. Yeah. yeah. So, but there are no better suggestions. So, what are you okay. going to do? Uh, and then, of course, there's matrona, which right. means specifically a married woman. Yes. But is like an important word. Now that one's pretty easy. Comes from comes mater, mother. mother. Yeah, mater. Which is, that goes back to yeah, a... Yeah, that goes all the way back uh, to... Proto-European, Proto-European root, that means mother. Yeah, no, that one's straightforward. So matrona, but it is a very common and important word for a married woman. Right. Of some status, right? Like it's, it's a respectable word. Mm-hmm. And then the word that means, like married to us for husband, the word that means only wife mm-hmm. and doesn't really just mean woman is uxor. Uxor. Right, I forgot about that one. Mm-hmm. Which means wife, spouse, consort. It doesn't have to be married, but it's your partner. But it really basically means wife. Which, of course, gives us the very common word uxorious. Yes. <laughs> Loving Excessively one's... fond yes. or submissive <laughs> to one's wife. Exactly. A state of great felicity. <laughs> so the etymology of this, according to... Calvert Watkins, and I usually trust him, is that it comes from the Proto-Indo-European root uxor, she who gets accustomed to a new household after patrilocal marriage. Seems an oddly specific word, but yes. Yeah, so I'm wondering what uk means. So it's uk sor. Yeah, the sor is the is the agent word. Yeah. There, right? Yeah, okay. So uksor on its own doesn't seem to be attested outside of italic there have been attempts to connect it to a proto-indo-european root uxen which might be from a root that means to become strong or perhaps from a root that means inseminator (laughs) or from a root that means to moisten make wet (laughs) 
alternatively... <laughs> Can we stop this entire line of the questioning now? I'm not really comfortable with it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> alternatively borrowed from proto Cartvelin, ux, usx, Sorry, sacrificial proto, bull. Proto Cartvelin, what? What's that? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Proto Cartvelian. What's Proto Cartvelian? No, wait, I don't want to know. Proto Cartvelian is a linguistic reconstruction of the common ancestor of the Cartvelian languages, which was spoken by the ancestors of the Cartvelian peoples. <laughs> We have not hit something that is meaningful to me yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's sort of in the steps somewhere. Okay. I mean, I'm sure it's just my ignorance. I'm sure everyone knows what Cartvelian is. Okay, Georgian. Oh, yeah. So this is something that... Our... Georgian. It's related to Georgian somehow. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so, Uxar. Odd word is what you're saying. Yeah. So I, I think basically it's a word that we only can trace to proto-italic so other italic languages, but we don't know where it comes from. Okay. So moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so then the parallel to anthropos, human, is, mm -hmm. of course, homo hominis. Right. Meaning a human being. Again, definitely defaults to man. So you can use homo to mean man. Mm -hmm. But it isn't really gendered any more than just the general world of the Romans was gendered. Small point. When I was looking up, so I looked up a bunch of these words by using a database online, Perseus, where you can look up words by their dictionary definitions. So you mm -hmm. can look for a word in the English definition in a Greek uh, dictionary. Sort, or, of, sort of like a, a cheap version of a thesaurus. Yeah, but a thesaurus for another language. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, a very useful thing. But you're restricted by what the words in the definitions are, right? Yeah, so like when I was looking up yeah. for words for sex, it was hard as, because it yeah, turns out they, be, no. they don't use the word sex, sex. They use the word coition. Coition, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, not as useful as it could be, but still very useful. However, boy, was that a way of reminding myself that the man is the unmarked category. Yes. Because if you look up the word <laughs> female, uh -huh. 7,000 entries, well, no, I exaggerate slightly, but all of which are a female servant, a female this, right a female on. that, a female butcher, a female baker, a female this. Whereas if you look at male, you do not find, find a male a, servant, yeah. a male, you find because a servant. Because the basic words for those things are all are, male. Or yeah. and, and even if they aren't, I mean, in Latin, it may not be that they're, like, they mm -hmm. may be a masculine and a feminine mm -hmm. that turn up just as equally, but the dictionary is sure yes. as heck going to say one is servant one is and the, the other normal... is female servant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, I know this, you know this, we all mm. know this, but like, nothing like that search to make that clear to me. <laughs> so anyway. So yeah, so homo hominis, which my dictionary told me was related to the word humus for soil and was therefore Earth. parallel to Adam. Right. The Hebrew word for parallel, not derived from, but parallel to that use of the word for dirt to mean man. So this is probably the best conjecture for it. Right. I don't think it's certain. But that root is the difficult to pronounce dgem, D H G H E M. So if you can aspirate make, a D I'm before an aspirated G. I'm just trying to find any of those in the word homo. There's no D or G <laughs> or E in this word. Sometimes linguistics does seem a little bit like lying. <laughs> <laughs> I think the D sound at the beginning is a sort of optional sound. Yeah, I know. And all the rest of it's just aspiration and all turns into... <laughs> I know. <laughs> so in Latin, the GH, the Proto-Indo-European GH, regularly becomes an H. Yeah. That's, so that's a regular sound. Change. It's the D, it's the DH in front yeah. of that that's problematic. But it's it parenthesized right. okay. in the stem, so <laughs> it doesn't always appear. Right. So yeah, Degem means earth. Yeah. Okay. And it can be found in... And there is, so there is a Latin words. word, humus. Humus, Which yeah. means earth, soil, mm -hmm. which of course gives us hummus. Sense. So this word also comes into, ah, and this would explain the DH part. It comes into Greek as, what would it be? Kthonos. Kthonos, yeah. Yeah, kthonic. Yes, the dictionary did make that parallel too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which Kthonos just means earth, ground. Right. So that is presumably where it comes from. Now, is that related to human? Is homo related to human? Mm -hmm. Again, I think that's the the standard explanation. Because obviously human does come from a Latin word, humanus. Mm -hmm. But beyond that. 
Treat yeah, I think people like a person, feel like Homo. pretty certain that human comes from that. Right. So um, it's just whether human and Homo both come from that. Both come from the same gem okay. root. So <laughs> Homo may or may not come from that. Humanos probably does. Right. Because where else is it? Going? Where's it? Come? Well, and as you say, there's the Humos. I mean, that that looks yeah. that looks closer, right? Yeah. So that that is certainly, I would say, from that root. Whether Homo also comes from that Degem root <laughs> is anyone's guess. It's presumed to, though. Cool. Okay. So those are my words for categories of people. Now, this is leaving aside, again, we're just doing the basics here. Maybe at some point we'll have a whole other episode on non-normative genders and gender roles and sexualities. We aren't even, we have not touched sexuality. Yeah. And I do not have any intention of doing so because no. it's far too huge and this is already too long. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I have a last few words about, you know. Grammatical gender. Well, I have stuff about grammatical gender, but I have a last few words that I want to talk about that specifically refer to. Boys and girls. Okay, sure. Which will basically me being saying, I don't know where it comes from. Because <laughs> these are really, for whatever reason, I guess because they're kind of slangy a bit. Yeah. They're very hard to track down. So boy, we don't know where it comes from. It, so it's first attested. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> it's first attested in mid 13th century with the sense servant commoner knave, generally young and male. Right. And so it kind of gets that sense of a rascal, a ruffian, a knave, an urchin, and later on a male child before puberty. That seems to be the most generally accepted suggestion of where it comes from. And this is kind of wild, but it comes from Old French embouy, one fettered from vulgar Latin imboyare, from Latin boya, leg iron, yoke, leather collar, from Greek, boii, dori, ox hides. And so therefore, it comes from the word for bull or ox or cow, the same, so the Proto-Indo-European root, gu, which produces the word cow in English and the word bos, boas in Latin. Let's That's just cannot, a wild etymology. You cannot see the <laughs> intense side eye I am giving you. This but that's the insane. best guess, honestly. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So there are other suggestions. There's a Germanic suggestion that it's related to a bunch of other Germanic words like Dutch boy, low German boy, that mean sort of something like boy or brother. And I wonder if, therefore, they, there's also Icelandic bofi. Uh, so there's a <laughs> bunch of B words. Okay. Bube in German means boy, knave, jack. So I wonder if this is related very distantly to brater, brother, that root, brater, which gives us frater, frater. in yeah. Latin. Huh, okay. Brother. That's total speculation. But that's total speculation. But it's either that or cow it comes from the root that means cow or bull. So, I don't know. Take your pick. All right. So, girl. <laughs> <laughs> girl is not going to get you any I know, further, I know, any I'm easier. Aware of that. <laughs> so, girl originally meant a child or young person of either sex. So, it was not mm -hmm. a gendered word. It was okay, just a just child. Child. Yeah. Uh, and it first appears in 1300. Again, origin unknown. So one suggestion is that it comes from a proposed Old English word, which means dress or apparel. Okay. However, this suggestion put forward by Fred Robinson, who is a well-known Old English scholar, has met with somewhat mixed reception, according to the OED. So it is certainly not... A consensus. A consensus on that. That is basically the best guess. Right. It just sort of appears out of nowhere. And he's connecting this to an Old English word that isn't actually attested, so which is kind of the problem. Well, so thank you for bringing up boy and girl and giving <laughs> us so much information on them. <laughs> but there are there are Germanic cognates that seem like they're probably related. So, but again, we don't know where it comes from. Another suggestion though, is that it comes from a Proto-Indo-European root, ger, that means short, 
child short. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. So who knows? Now, the the common Old English word for girl actually is not, obviously this is not attested yeah. in Old English, yeah. is maid or maiden, which right. again, we've talked about before in uh, a previous episode. Mm -hmm. It was the uh, Christmas episode, the 12... Maids of Milk. Yeah, the 12 maids, well, the power maid, maids there were. Uh, so that comes from uh, the Proto-Indo-European root magu, which means a young person of either which... sex. Also of, of interest, I suppose, is the word child, which at various points, it vacillates whether it refers to children generally or mm -hmm. to girl children or to boy children. Okay. So this is the word that throughout its history in English seems to vacillate. So it's interesting for that standpoint. Okay. And so kind of segueing into our discussion of grammatical gender, the word maiden, maiden in Old English was neuter because the E-N diminutive is, is, a neuter. is a neuter ending. It's like okay. midken in German, which is also neuter. Which is also neuter. Whereas the, the form maith, which is the non-diminutive form, is feminine. Right. And so that takes us to grammatical gender. So we should preface this discussion by saying that not all languages have grammatical gender. Many languages don't. Exactly how many do and how many don't is, I've got kind of quite varying right. estimates of this. Okay. So according to Wikipedia, one quarter of the world's languages have grammatical gender. However, to a specialist on the very topic of grammatical gender, Greville Corbett, and this is specifically drawn from his article in the Encyclopedia of Language and Linguistics, he says in a sample of 256 languages, somewhat over half, 144, were found to have no gender system. So... Okay. Half, half. A gender system with at least two genders, and two gender systems are common, existed in 50 examples of this sample. Mm -hmm. Three genders was about half as common, only 26 examples. And four genders was about half as common again, only 12 examples. Larger systems with more than four genders, with five or more genders, represented a substantial Minority. So basically, the more genders, mm -hmm. the less common it, it's going to be worldwide. Are you going to define what a grammatical gender is? I will, I will come to some, a very specific definition of this. Okay. So of the languages with a gender system, the majority had an assignment system, which I will talk about in more detail in a minute, an assignment system based on sex. So in other words, grammatical gender lining up more or less with some idea of natural gender. Okay. So that's 84 examples of that, what did I say, 256. Okay. But 28 languages of the sample, notably in the Niger, Congo, and Algonquian families, had systems based on animacy. Yeah, whether something is animate or animate. not, so mobile not, or not, yeah. speaks or not, those kinds of things. Yeah. Right. So not at all based on this idea of sexual you organs. Know, <laughs> organs, yeah. And as for the type of assignment system, which I will kind of get into in more detail in a minute, whether it's strictly based on semantics, so in other words, the meaning of the word is mm -hmm. somehow connected to how you divide up the words into genders, or ones that are at least predominantly based on semantics, were found in just under half the languages, 53 examples, while a slight majority, 59 examples, had both semantic and formal assignments. And so the shape of the word, mean, yeah, you, the sound of the word. So formal here means very literally form. The form the of the form word. form of the word. The form of the word, the sound of the word. So all of this is to say that there's a lot of complexity, yeah. very, a lot of variation across the world in terms of different gender systems, whether or not they even have a gender system. Mm -hmm. Many have sex as a component, but some don't. As I say, the, the Algonquian mm -hmm. languages have animate, inanimate. So here's one definition that we can kind of use as a baseline for uh, a, a definition of grammatical gender. This comes from the linguist Hockett. He wrote that genders are classes of nouns reflected in the behavior of associated words. So, so words like adjective, an adjective, most primarily. Or a definite article. Yeah. Or, or a pronoun, if you have pronoun, or a, a verb. Because sometimes some verbs some ver in some languages, yeah. the verb can reflect the gender of the noun. Yeah. So gender must involve agreement between right. the noun, 
which is the trigger, and some other word, which is the target. Right. So for those who are used to Latin and Greek, let's say, this is what differentiates it from a declension, which yes. is, of course, a random, arbitrary term as well, but is something that differentiates mm -hmm. a set of words that follow a particular pattern mm -hmm. for cases mm -hmm. and that don't need to agree. They could be the only word in a sentence. Yeah. There could be no adjectives, no anything, mm -hmm. and yet it will have a certain ending and there's a pattern to how those fat fit. So that's why a noun both has gender and a declension in yeah. in those. I mean, that's not always going to be true mm -hmm. in every language, mm -hmm. but in those languages that you might know if you know Latin mm -hmm. and Greek. That's why those are separate issues. Separate that issues. That overlap, mm -hmm. but do not. Are so not sometimes the same. in some languages, the declension of a noun can line up with the gender. And maybe be exclusive to it. Sometimes yeah. not, or sometimes some of the time, yeah. but not all of the time. So it yeah. So they can like be Latin, for instance. Yeah. First declension, mostly feminine. Yeah. Second declension, mostly masculine. And neuter. And neuter, yes. Yes. In and fact, third... always masculine and neuter. Are there any yep. feminine trees? Oh, okay, trees. Okay, there are good. like All seven right. trees that right. are feminine. <laughs> That's good that they occur in a group like that because yeah. that sort of makes sense as to how and these things develop. And then third, third declension, every gender. Fourth declension, masculine, feminine, and neuter. I think all, all of them. And fifth declension, only feminine. Right. So like... That's not a lot of rhyme and reason to it. There are, but there are, there patterns. are patterns. There are but patterns. But third yeah. declension, for instance, totally non, you know, there are patterns within it, but the declension. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So sometimes, depending on the tradition, a study of some languages will prefer to use the term gender. Sometimes they'll prefer to use the term noun classes. Mm -hmm. Basically, Especially it's the if same it doesn't idea. line up. If with... it doesn't line yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. So you will see these terms used sometimes interchangeably. interchangeably. So... Grammatical gender, therefore, can affect the noun inflection itself, mm -hmm. if the noun is inflected, in languages where the noun is inflected. Right. That's the trigger, as I say. And, or, the inflection of those associated words, the so, target words. The target words, when we say inflection, we mean a change in the form. Yeah. In, again, in a Latin or Greek, if you know that, usually means the ending. Endings. In other languages, in other, it, it can be the prefix, beginning of the word. It might mean a vowel in the middle of the word. Yeah. It might mean a change to a stem consonant. Different it just things. means a change in the form. A change in the form of the word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in Latin, the gender affects the inflection of the noun. Yeah. But say in French, where nouns aren't inflected at all, but they still affect the, the associated article, words. The article. The article, the adjectives. And even verbs. In terms of past participles. Right, in terms of past participles. So the targets can include anything from adjectives, determiners like articles, pronouns with pronoun agreement, quantifiers like words like few, many. Mm -hmm. Numbers. Or numbers. Yeah, numerals. Possessives, participles, verbs. So in some languages, I think this is true of Russian. The verb marks gender. Right. And all kinds of other categories. It can mm -hmm. be apparently even adverbs, and I don't have an example language for this, but it, it boggles the mind how, how the noun could affect an, an adverb. But there you go. It can, uh, in some languages, do that. Yeah. So grammatical gender is inherent to nouns and pretty much nouns only. It is marked on all these various targets. Now, the obvious question then is, how do these nouns get their gender? In other words, how does gender assignment work? Mm. And there are basically two factors in the assignment of gender to those nouns. The meaning of the noun, the semantic. Yeah, well, you already talked about this, yeah. and the form. And the form. Yeah. So many languages are strictly or predominantly semantic, as I said before. In other words, their gender systems, and some languages can be quite strict. So the Dravidian languages are apparently quite strict in this regard. Right. So words that fall into certain semantic categories, like, because of what say, they animals mm -hmm. or blue things or like i don't know about dravidian but like in, yeah. a, in a given language it could be things that move or in dravidian i think the sort of highest level is rational non-rational and they're various subcategories right. right but so it but it's according to some categorization of yeah. what things actually are yeah regardless of what the form of the word looks yeah. like it's just based on that meaning mm -hmm. so that would be the, mo the one end of the extremes yeah in predominantly semantically based gender systems, the division may sometimes seem arbitrary. So like Latin is kind of like this, right? Mm -hmm. But 
often things like worldview, including things like mythology, can explain some of these divisions. So like why is moon and sun or trees? So the trees, why are those second declension nouns that mm -hmm. should be by form mm -hmm. masculine? Yeah. yeah. The general assumption is it's because trees were thought to have female spirits. Yeah. Nymphs. And yeah, why is why are in, in different languages, moon and sun can be, you know, the moon can be masculine or feminine, depending on which culture it comes from. And usually that's based on some mythological yeah. connection. Though so there's a very chicken and egg problem there, right? Right. If the word has a grammatical a form, form that makes it feminine. So like, why is justice female? Yeah. And we'll come to that. Like those ones are definitely. We'll come to this, that, that other way that yeah. it, this so could work in a minute. Some of them are definitely form first personification or gender assignment later, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. But no languages assign gender by purely formal assignments. So there's always some element of semantic gender assignment. Okay. There are no languages in the world that anyone's found. Where there aren't some categories where you can find like this group yeah. and that group and this group all yeah. fit into this gender. Now, the formal rules can be one of two things. It can be phonological or morphological. So for instance, a phonological example would be in French. 99% of nouns ending in un that nasalized sound, like mm -hmm. the word pain, bread, are masculine. Okay. So that's one subcategory it's of masculine. One subcategory. It's not the only. Not, not the, yeah. the only. But there are, there are various languages where phonological can be a big part of it. Right. And then the other example is morphological. So, for instance, in Russian, inflectional classes line up almost always with grammatical gender, with just a few exceptions. Okay. Which is not true in Latin, of course, because it's got all these ones that, that mm -hmm. don't. So some of the common gender division systems found in the world's languages, masculine, feminine, two gender systems. So gender is mostly in line with sex and other nouns fit into one of the two, sometimes appearing arbitrary. So this includes Romance languages, Baltic languages, Celtic languages, Hindustani languages like Hindi and Urdu, Afro-Asiatic languages, including Semitic languages, Berber languages, and so forth. Then you've got the three gender system, masculine, feminine, neuter, in which this mainly falls in line with human sex, though with some exceptions. And then all the remaining nouns fall into one of the three genders, masculine, mm -hmm. feminine, or neuter. Many Indo-European languages are like this. So Sanskrit, Latin, Greek, Germanic, Slavic, they all have that, right. that three gender system. Then you have the animate, inanimate to gender system. So in these languages, generally what you see is mainly humans and animals falling into the animate gender and everything else into the inanimate gender. And Proto-Indo-European may originally have been like this. Hmm. Since the earliest branch to split off from Proto-Indo-European, the Anatolian branch, which includes Hittite, which is the earliest recorded Indo-European language, language, yeah. language yeah. works like this. Now, most Indo-European languages today have three genders, masculine, feminine, neuter, but... Well, I mean, most of them have lost neuter. A lot of them have lost or neuter. many. The Romance languages the Romance have, have lost, lost, neuter. lost neuter. neuter. Yeah. So the theory is that feminine morphology in Indo-European languages was a later development and may have begun as an abstract noun class, actually. Oh, okay. Which explains why in Latin, for instance, you think of all the abstract nouns, they're all feminine, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so that could, there's a, specifically, there's a an ending mm -hmm. that is a feminine ending, the itia. Yeah, but there's also the itudo. Oh, yeah. Okay. All of the, and yeah, they're third. The, the, yeah. They could the be, it like, could be yeah, either masculine. There's but nothing there's... inherent in the, the ending that makes it mm -hmm. clear, mm -hmm. but they're all feminine. Right. So the A stems which is like the Latin first declension, they do show up that, so that's an Indo-European noun class okay. and that shows up in Anatolian. So that's that branch that broke away really right. early, but only in abstract nouns. It doesn't mark feminineness. Hmm. So it seems that that was the original purpose of that. Okay. By the way, just to point out, and I know you know this, but the, the genitive ending in that A stem in the first mm -hmm. declension was the genitive singular was originally A-S, like yeah. paterfamilias, yeah. Yeah. and that goes back to Indo-European endings. The A-E ending probably 
well, was originally AI, mm -hmm. so early Latin spellings will be and, AI. And it's AI. And, and that I Greek probably too. comes from the second declension. Right. From the masculine. Right. One. Okay. It gets burrowed in and stuck after the A, and then that AI becomes AE. So yeah, so th as I said, you know, this research indicates that the earliest stages of Proto-Indo-European had this two-gender system, animate and inanimate, as in Hittite. And the classification of nouns based on animacy or inanimacy and the lack of gender are today characteristic of Armenian. So according to this theory, animate gender, which unlike inanimate gender, had independent vocative and accusative forms, later split into masculine and feminine. So the animate category right, okay. became masculine, feminine, okay. uh, and thus leaving us with, with the three classification, masculine, feminine, and that neuter, which was the inanimate originally. And so the general pattern is that a lot of these Indo-European languages reduced the number of genders, as you say, in yeah. Romance yeah. languages, reduced it to two, and the, those neuter words then got divided up between mm -hmm. masculine and feminine. There are some cases in which the they reduced it to two, but more by going backwards. In other words, the the feminine and masculine get coalesced into a common gender. Right. But the neuter is is, is retained. retained right. So that you see that in Swedish and Danish, for instance. Okay, yes. And arguably Russian has created a fourth gender. Because <laughs> Russian does that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then of course there are some languages that lost gender altogether, like English and Afrikaans is also seems mo mostly true of that language as well. Only traces and things like, you know, as, a, as an English with and, pronouns yeah. and things. And uh, that's true of a bunch of other languages, Indo-European languages, like mm -hmm. Persian, and a whole bunch of other, you know, probably not the, the, the most well-known, the, the most populous, most spoken languages, but it's true of a bunch of languages. Right. Now, this animate, inanimate Division not only found in Indo-European, but it's in other languages in the world. Basque is like that, has an animate, inanimate. Mm -hmm. Ojibwe has animate, inanimate. Right. Okay. And as I said, Algonquian languages mm -hmm. are like that. Now there is the common neuter category. Again, this is probably what happened with, well, this seems to be what happened in Swedish and Danish, mm -hmm. where masculine, feminine used to be separate, but they get coalesced. Mm -hmm. So you see that pattern in some languages. And there are other systems. So in the Dravidian languages, the division is human, non-human, or rational, yeah, non-rational, which already. I mentioned. And then there is the famous example of the gerbil language, which has, it's a, an Australian language, which, or family of languages, I think, that has four genders. So the first is most animate objects and men. Mm -hmm. Second gender is women, water, fire, violence, and exceptional animals. Third gender is edible fruit and vegetables. And the fourth gender is miscellaneous and includes things that are not classifiable in the first three. And this is the language that inspired the title of George Lakoff's book, Women, Fire, and Dangerous Things. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of ways of dividing up words mm -hmm. semantically. Mm -hmm. Basing it on sex is a very common one, but it is not the only one. Now, there are some reasons why doing this can be useful. In a language that has explicit inflections for gender, it's easy to express the natural gender of animate beings. A grammatical gender can be a valuable tool for disambiguation if you've got pronouns, mm -hmm. right? So it can make things more clear what the antecedent of a word is. Yes. And in sort of more literary writing and poetry and so forth, gender can be used to animate inanimate things. Mm -hmm. It's also potentially useful in distinguishing homophones. So if two words sound the same, but they actually mean completely different things, if they're of two different genders, that's a way of distinguishing them. And as you sort of alluded to before, we can think about the cognitive effects of having grammatical gender. And this is kind of referring to the work of Lyra Borditsky and others. When assigning voices to inanimate objects, grammatical gender tends to influence the selection. So if the word is grammatically male, you would assign a masculine voice. That doesn't sound too surprising, but it's also true that when asked to describe nouns, grammatical gender may 
influence the decision. So for instance, in one test, German speakers describe a bridge, which in German is Brücke, which is feminine. They more often used words like beautiful, elegant, pretty, or slender. So stereotypically female qualities. We're really getting gender. into gender as opposed to sex here, yes. very largely. Yeah. So while German speakers would assign these stereotypical feminized, feminized qualities to an inanimate object that happens to be feminine in gender, Spanish speakers, whose word for bridge is a masculine word, puente, use words like big, dangerous, strong, sturdy. So there can be cognitive effects of having a gender system that is based Aligned. semantically on either predominantly or strictly with sex. Mm -hmm. Though presumably it could be if you had other yeah. alignments, so it could have it, cognitive effects too. These have been studied with these yeah. grammatical gender ones, but I imagine if it's animate, inanimate. Animate, you, could, you would have similar. Yeah, we could have, have that. You effect. could have similar things, yeah. All right. Are we done? Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, it's all very interesting. It's just there's so much uh, mm -hmm. to talk about. And so like we didn't even get into gender roles in the ancient world or sexuality or transgender or anything else. And we're not going to because I'm pretty sure we're at two hours. So I think we need to stop. <laughs> and we might need an expert to, to get into some, some of these Some of these things areas. we need to get an, an expert to talk about. I mean, some of these things I have taught on. But, but yeah, I mean, these would be interesting... There's a whole bunch of other topics we can return to at various mm -hmm. points, and we might do that with guests sometime. That would be fun. But for now, let's stop there. I'm not even going to read the Latin poems I had prepared to read <laughs> to you. So you all get one whole episode without a Latin poem. You know, it's hard. It's hard to get by. But you're just going to have to do it. And I think we'll stop here. So, Gabby, I have no idea if that answered anything <laughs> of your questions. But thank you for the suggestion, because it was certainly interesting to me. And I learned things. Indeed. Both in my own research and from Mark. And it has reminded us of a very wide and fruitful, productive, generative <laughs> subject that we can return to and explore more fully. Yes. And that's it. Good night. Good night. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.